All right, folks, we're back. I'm your host, BKP, and we are at Circuit World in Blue Ridge, Georgia, in 20 degrees. I was looking for you, Doc. This is Dr. Whaley. Ask the Doc with Dr. William Whaley. Uh, the computer over here is Ray. Ray is on vacation. Thank you, Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. I said, where is the weather report? It's cold. Where's my tie? I don't know. What, what do you think about the tie? Wait a minute. I think you look nice today. I'm well. here. Thank you. I'm here. I'm here because D Dr. T's out of town. I got a plane to catch at one o'clock to go to New Orleans. Remember, I'm taking my grandkids to New Orleans, and in two days. Is it New Orleans? New Orleans. They are going to see what took me 30, 40 years to see, all in two days. Because, you know, I used to have a a consulting business there with Delta Airlines and the aviation business, mm -hmm. but in 40 years, I got to the Bayou once, and I got to the cemetery once, and I got to this place once, and I got a guy just picking us up at 9 o'clock in the morning and and running those teenage kids to so many things. They going It's going to be 40 degrees and windy and rainy, and we're going down a Bayou and an airboat and we're going to, you know, eat on in Pucco's house for I me mean, a place for a Cajun lunch, and then we're going to eat beignets. And we, I mean, we're going. You got to order like Cajun. You got to order etouffee. Is that what you said? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I like do, that. I like et, et, first. etouffee or or mud bugs. Mud bugs are good. Yeah, I went down. I went. What down. are mud bugs? I don't know. <laughs> Crawfish. Crawfish. I caught. I went. I, when I went to Louisiana, the first time I'd ever went to Louisiana. You know, um, across the Louisiana state line, we were driving, and I walked in. I walked into uh, the welcome center, and there's two ladies there, and and I said, "I've never been to Louisiana in my life. I want the best Cajun meal I've ever had, and I'm not going to some big city. I want to go to some town." And they bantered back and forth on what was best, but they settled on Monroe, Louisiana. So they sent me to Monroe, Louisiana, never been there before in my life, and drove to Monroe, Louisiana, and found this place they told me about. So I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm going to get the best Cajun meal I've ever had in my life. I'm guaranteed that in this place. I'm going to get my catfish and everything. So she said, well, whatever you do, when you go in there, you order etouffee. Right? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Etouffee. Etouffee, right? And I said, I thought she was playing a joke on me. <laughs> I didn't want to go in this place and, and ask be, for it. Yeah, be I said, Mom, are you serious? I'm serious. That'd be like a snipe you got to, you yeah. Got, yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay, Mom. So I went in there. I enjoyed it. There you yeah, go. That's, okay, that's the end of that story. Right. I didn't mean to take the Did point. you get jambalaya? Yeah. Okay, you get mud bugs? I stayed for two hours. That's all I'm going <laughs> to tell did, you. Did you get mud bugs? Huh? Did you get no, mud I bugs? No, I don't remember that. It's crawfish. They come in a, oh, okay. a bucket. Yeah, yeah the big old, they're, like, they're like little tiny lobsters mm -hmm. sort of things. Okay. All right, moving right along. All right, well, so we, you're headed to the That's why we don't have a tie. That's, that's where this all started. And, and I, instead today. of going down early, so you're letting Ray do it, ain't, ain't no Ray, so... Here I am. Okay, so that's commitment to the program. See, I'm not going to make you watch a cold one from back in the past. See, we could have pulled one up, made like yeah, it was Yeah, let's go today. into the archives, but no, we're not doing Well, we're that. not doing an archive show today. We, right. we, we may have to do one, you know, sooner or later. There, the, We have two questions today that are... Uh, 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 the first one is a, is a, is a matter that... that is very rarely discussed and is misunderstood by many, many physicians. So I'm going to try and straighten out the question, ask it in such a way as to to tell you what the confusion is. And then the second question is is a you know things aren't too good question, and it's uh, there's a lot in it, there's a lot in it. So let, listen to this first question. I'll tell you what to do. Put up the first picture first. Got it up there? You'll remember that frequently I have mentioned Angelina Jolie talking about genetics of breast cancer and her having had mastectomies and hysterectomies and how she did so much for public health by bringing this to public attention and then um, uh, who was the black actor with the 
with the uh, prostate cancer. Um, oh, you remember. Anyway, so one of the one of the big big black actors who had prostate cancer came out, and then um, um, the guy who had to, whose mother had colon cancer. You see his pictures in all the airports. So anyway, when a when a famous person comes out and tells their story of a malignancy, then it it it, it allows you to talk about it without it seeming so funny so you're looking at Farrah Fawcett and you're looking at Marsha Cross these are two young attractive highly uh, visible women who have told their story so you can pull it down while I people don't focus on uh, Farrah Fawcett every guy in here is over 40 probably had her poster on his wall what do you think not saying anything my sister is 70 years old Farrah's not 70 yet is she I bet she is I bet she is 70 and takes no medications and has no significant history. She had rectal bleeding and was seen in the local ER, and a CT scan was negative. Now, that's important. It'll come up later. And the ER doc gave her antibiotics for, di for diverticulitis, but also said he was not sure of the diagnosis. That's because the CT scan right. was negative. And he sent her to a GI for a colonoscopy, which was done five days ago. He had to use a pediatric scope due to obstruction, and he diagnosed HPV positive anal squamous cell cancer. Very important that the guy that's asked the question knows that it's squamous cell and the gastroenterologist labeled it anal. He said this was completely different from rectal cancer that I described last week. So this means this question's two weeks old. I think a week before last I talked about um, rectal cancer. But it sounds the same. The oncologist recommended immediate chemotherapy and radiation to prevent obstruction. That's exactly what we recommended two weeks ago when the guy was near obstructed with rectal cancer. The oncologist recommended uh, radiation that is different and that they would not take the tumor out under normal circumstances after the treatment. Now, he mentions that because a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the, radio, the rectal cancer, you remember, this patient was going to take pills, radiation therapy, for six weeks, four, four to six weeks, have four weeks of rest, and have surgery to remove the tumor. They said right off the bat that under normal circumstances after treatment, they would not do surgery. Well, that means they expect this to be more successful and to be curative, whereas in the rectal cancer, they expected it to convert this to, or to bring the ripples back toward the center, as I've said before, and convert the rectal tumor into a more easily removable surgical case. So that's, the, that's basically the situation, and he knows that. So he says, what is this diagnosis, and what is different? You understand what he just said? Mm -hmm. Got it? Yes. Okay, well, we're not going to show the pictures of Farrah Fawcett anymore, but we are talking, and he, he said it in the question. Show up the next one. We are talking about anal cancer. Right. Okay, now. We're going to here put the next one up because this is exactly the same show we had with a different malignancy in it when we talked about the rectal cancer two weeks ago. You see this anatomy here? Right. Okay, this is the anus or the bottom end, and this is the rectum. You see, they're right there together. Mm -hmm. The cancer that we were talking about two weeks ago was right here, right it right there where you see up about 25 percent of the way then that big wide open spot that's where the rectal cancer was see that little bit of spot right there that's where the anal cancer is pull that down they have two entirely different behaviors 
anal and rectal. All right. He said okay. squamous cell, right? Uh-huh. Remember, all the cancers in the rectum and colon are adenocarcinomas. Glandular carcinomas are not squamous. And the behavior of those two are different. Right. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. The causation is different. Let's just talk about the, the normal colorectal adenocarcinoma. We remember we say high-fiber diet moves potential contaminants in your food through maybe taking an aspirin or a non-steroidal might diminish the amount of polyps that you have, get a routine colonoscopy, and if you have polyps, get more frequent ones because polyps can convert into adenocarcinoma. None of that applies to anal squamous cell cancer. Colonoscopy is not used to screen for it. Uh, you, there is not a pre-malignant lesion that you would go back uh, well, there's a pre-malignant lesion, but it's not the kind of thing like a polyp. Are you still with me? So who gets anal cancer? Pull it back up again. He said it was HPV positive cancer. HPV positive cancer. Okay. What other HPV positive cancers have we talked about in the last month? Cervical. Cervical and head and neck. Okay, pull that down. So the HPV virus which can be prevented by the shot that kids now get it at 12 years old before they go to school. Yes. Causes cancer. 95% of the head and neck cancers are caused by it. 95% of cervix cancer in women are caused by it. 95% of anal cancer, which is men and women, are caused by it. So this is another HPV-related malignancy. Put up the next one. So... This is split into two pieces, anal cancer on one side, colorectal cancer on the other. What causes it? Well, anal cancer is the HPV virus, colorectal cancer. Now, you remember we said you can have some genetic predispositions if your families have polyps. That's pre-genetic. There are things about looking at a rubber plant or various contaminants in food that could be in your GI tract, but, but the risk factors are totally and entirely different. So you could, you could pull that down. The, tip of the, the treatments are entirely different. So let's put up this very busy slide. Is that a busy slide? Residence corner. So this is a teaching slide for residents and house officers that, that sort of gets anal cancer into a picture but the important part of it is, you see he's got that, that, he's got that microscope over there? You can pull that down. It's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to, to make this diagnosis unless the patient is complaining of rectal bleeding or think they have a hemorrhoid or a fissure, and that's what she was doing. She was complaining so bad she went to the ER. Because in a colonoscopy, the colonoscope is inserted through the anus and you don't look at the anus. You start the looking when you're in the rectum going forward. So you could have, it's think of squamous cell cancer on my skin, a pre-malignant lesion in the region of the anus would look like some of these sun damaged areas on my forehead and you would have to be able to look real carefully at the anus with a scope, but you can't do that because it's clamping down, right? So you have to push the scope through there. You don't visualize it. Well, I'm an old man, and I frequently do digital rectal exams on patients who come to see me for anemia or breast cancer or head and neck cancer or something unrelated to that half of the body because a complete physical examination concludes a rectal exam, and they don't really teach that in medical school anymore. And that's, that's a shame. I'm you, a you and I were talking off, off camera. In the green room? Yeah, in the green room. Right. You and I were talking about the differences in, in, in examinations, and mm -hmm. I, not to quote you, but you said something which I wish we would get back to what a real examination is when you come in and sit down. Right. You had in your mind that if the guy doesn't check your carotids, he's right. not being complete. 
and and checking checking that we talked about testicular cancer last week and doing self exams. A physician should sit, check any male's testicular size and his inguinal rings. Does he have a hernia? And if the guy's over about 30, he should do a digital rectal and check his prostate. That's one of the screening tests for prostate cancer. They really don't do that. Primary care doctors' only way of screening for prostate cancer now is they do a blood test. Well, that blood test didn't exist when I came along. If you want to make the diagnosis, you had to do a physical exam, feel a hard prostate. Okay, you're going to put up the next one. We're not going to have it up there long. But this middle part here is survival curve and control. And this survival curve and control with the squamous cell cancer of the anus is much better than the rectal. And you'll notice it says 69% over here and 33 and 54% over there. You don't need to go through the details of it, but pull it down. You can pull it down so they'll focus too much on it. That, but at the same size of tumor, the same depth of penetration, the anal cancer has a much better outlook and actually will be cured in most cases by the chemo radiation therapy that they are going to get. I'm going to show you here in a minute. But the chemo is different. When I was talking about treating the rectal cancer last two weeks ago, it was a chemo pill. It's not very tough. Blood counts don't get adversely affected. Now, they might after you've done the surgery and you go back to adjuvant therapy, but during the anal cancer radiation and chemo, you're only going to get chemo for the four or five weeks that you're getting radiation. It will be a bit more intense chemotherapy. So now we go to our algorithm. And I, I love these NCCN guideline algorithms because they – First of all, this is state of the art. They change them every week or two if the information changes. But as I have hinted at through this discussion, and every time I talk, that younger physicians lean heavily on tests and don't lean so heavily on physical examinations. And on talking about rectal cancer in the last two or three weeks ago, I think we talked about rectal cancer twice in eight weeks. I emphasize that a special technique, rectal technique, MRI was important because you had to know, going back to that cross-section of the rectum, where within millimeters that tumor went as it came to the place where the, where the lining of the, of the abdomen reflects around that malignancy because if it goes after it reflects around here, it becomes much more likely to spread. The surgery is a little bit different. So if you had rectal cancer, put that up there now, the NCCN guideline. If this said rectal cancer over here, and it would say biopsy adenocarcinoma, where well, this says is squamous carcinoma, which this patient had, then it said workup. Well, this workup that they would recommend there would, would begin with colonoscopy, MRI, CT, and everything else. What's this one begin with? What's that? Digital. Rectal examination. Right. Digital rectal Dict exam. Part of the physical exam. Right. I, I, you haven't ever seen an NCCN guideline that said do a physical examination and check the rectum, except right here. It doesn't even say that in prostate cancer. Well, I had a patient last, the patient two weeks ago with rectal cancer that I could feel the depth of the cancer by doing a digital rectal. And I knew before we did any MRIs or anything else what the surgery was going to be like because you had to know that before we had the MRI. And we made that decision based on a physical exam with a finger, much not a $7,000 test with an MRI machine. And then the next thing it says is examine the inguinal left nodes. That means feel them. And then it gets into tests, biopsies and MRIs and stuff. Okay, now, if there's no metastatic disease, and generally there's not, then the treatment is chemoradiation therapy. Now pull that down. He wanted to know, they said they would not 
take the tumor out under normal circumstances after the treatment. I had said a few weeks ago, even if the rectal cancer is 100% gone on scan, after the chemo radiation therapy, the area where it was will be surgically removed and the lymph nodes around it will be pathologically sampled because the radiation and chemotherapy is not curative. Here we are two weeks later, talking about a cancer in the same neighborhood, anal rectal, you saw it, they're right side by side, and they're not gonna take the cancer out after only four to six weeks of radiation and chemotherapy. What is the difference? Got one more algorithm here for you. I always like, you know, you gotta have a couple of algorithms. <clears throat> So here's this algorithm. The, the NCC and guideline would have been above this. The chemo radiation therapy has been finished. Four weeks later, you're going to do, I'll be darned, you're going to do another digital, digital rectal mm -hmm. 11 weeks after, 18 weeks after, and 26 weeks after. You're going to put a scope in there and look around. You're going to do another abdominal pelvic CT at 26 weeks. How long is 26 weeks? Uh, six just over months. two years. <laughs> six months. Almost 26 52 months. 52 weeks in a year, right? 26 weeks, sorry. Right? Six, six months. months. All right. Six so, months. You're, for, so for so six months, you're going to keep looking six months. Okay. to make right. sure it went away. And if it's a complete response, you're going to follow, follow up. up. Right. If there's anything left, you are going to surgery. surgery. All right, well, I had a bunch of pictures she was looking at, and we decided when we were going through this that we were going to throw multiple of those pictures out. But to put up the one picture we say. Oh, come on. All right. Okay, but this is the least amount of surgery that you would have. It would be, you've seen enough of that, seen enough of that, pull it out. Okay, I'll, I'll describe it without looking at the picture. But to do this surgery, you're, you've got the anus in the middle of your buttocks you're going to end up taking out a big hunk of, of, of meat you remember when we did we said why you don't want to do head and neck surgery because you'd have to take a flap put it up here rebuild a tongue take a rib rebuild a rebuild a jaw and if you could get cure without taking a rib rebuilding the jaw moving a flap and skin covering up a big hole why would you want to do it well, that is exactly why you don't want to end up having to do this surgery. And in my experience, the number of people who end up having to have surgery are somewhere in the 1% to 4% range. So this patient should do well, assuming that all the rest of these tests are normal. That is the difference between the anal cancer and the rectal cancer I described two weeks ago. And they are clearly different diseases, totally different causations, little bit different age group but not a lot of different age group because remember the head and neck cancer now is coming in younger people it's not the old veteran who smoked two packs a day after world war ii and this cancer you got those two young women there occurred in both of them when they were in their 50s so instead of being 70s this patient is 70 they were in their 50s or 60s that's not a whole lot different but it is caused by the HPV virus, same as head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, anal cancer, and letting your adolescent children get immunized against HPV is preventative for this disease. And when I remember one more time, I said when the HPV vaccine came out many years ago, I was against it. Do you remember why I was against it? No. I, don't. I have four daughters. Oh, okay. And my daughters were in the age group of 12, 14, and giving them that shot is saying to the world they are going to be sexually active and they are more than likely going to have more than one sexual partner and we are going to try to prevent them from getting this virus, which they never would have known they had, if they have multiple sex parties. So I was against it as a daddy of little girls. Now that all of them are in their 50s and I'm an oncologist with the older age group and I see this devastating 
uh, epidemic of HPV-related malignancies, I've changed my mind. Let your kids get the shot. I have a quick question on this. You've been doing your homework. Well, no, no. I want to. I want to. I want to ask this question. Right, and uh, we're talking about examinations. So, if if you go for a colonoscopy and you you're told um, at 50 or whatever, I can't remember. 50. All right, and you're told to to go for a colonoscopy, and you go in and you and you and you leave, and doctor comes in and says, "I'll see you in five years." Ten. Ten. It was totally it? normal to be ten. Okay. So what does it say? I see you in ten years. We can't leave thinking that everything's going to be perfect for ten years. Correct. Something could develop in that ten years. Correct. That's when you should, on your own, go get your next colonoscopy. Correct. But between then and and the ten years, what are some of the things that develop that you say? Well, wait a minute. Maybe maybe I need to go to the doctor. I, I you know I, I just you got a clear you colonoscopy. Go, you, don't, you don't go to the doctor without symptoms. And when you have a let's let's say you're 50 years old. Well, you know when you're 50 years old and you put on your shoes, you tie your right shoe 100 percent of the time before your left one. You're not going to change. When I shower. Since I was in the Navy, we only had 15 seconds of water to get wet, and we had 20 seconds of water to rinse. If, if you would put it, the water came on, you 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 got you wet and you soaked, and there was no water. And this is the officers too. Then when you flipped the switch over to rinse, it was 20 seconds worth of water, and it was gone. I mean, you're at sea and you're making your water by boiling it and trying to, you know, trying to have a combat a combat ready ship. You don't t take what they call a Hollywood shower. So I still shower rapidly, okay? But I have noticed, particularly since my Ray, Ray, Ray's barber, my barber, you know, gave a shampoo, probably your barber too, and tells me to do such and such, lather it up and do this. I can't use, I can't use conditioner. Not because I can't use conditioner, but my habit won't let me run the water long enough to use the 30, conditioner. 35 seconds. I, you can't you can't use something that says one minute if you're taking a 35 second shower. I just can't do it. So I just don't do it. I mean, I guess I could change my habit. So anyway, what I'm trying to say here is to answer your question. Let's just use colon. Let's use colonoscopy and colorectal health. If you have a substantial change in your bowel habit that you cannot attribute to have gone on a diet trying to lose weight, or your wife saying, I've read that uh, you know we should have prune juice and, uh, and oatmeal for breakfast, and I saw it on YouTube, and they, you know, they do something to you, your bowel habit changes, don't worry about it. But if you're eating exactly the same thing and stuff that your habit is, and you begin having difficulty passing your stool, or you have more stool, or you see little flecks of blood in it, or it changes color and it gets black, or it changes odor and begins to smell differently. Even if you have no other symptoms, you go get that looked at. Now, to the rect, to the anus, see, I saw, even I did it, I'd say to the rectum, that to the anus, this is going to be painful stool like you have a split in your lip here from a bar that open your mouth and it hurts to eat a hamburger. The, at the other end, if it, if it hurts to have an evacuation or you notice blood on the, the toilet tissue or you notice blood on the stool, you do not diagnose yourself. And this is the problem I see all the time. And this patient had done the same thing. I'm confident. Oh, that's just hemorrhoids. Well, if you're 55 years old or 60 and you didn't have them yesterday, you don't make your diagnosis of hemorrhoids. If you went to the doctor last year because you had rectal bleeding and you had hemorrhoids and he treated it and you quit using the preparation and following the diet and it's a year later and it happens again, you can say, yeah, okay, it may be hemorrhoids. But if it's the first time, you do not diagnose yourself. What do you do? Go to the doctor. Go to the I mean, doctor. Yeah, well, exactly. Lord have mercy. So that's what you just asked me. Oh, that's okay. what you do. You Thank go to the doctor. No. All right. Okay, let's get on to the next one because this is a 
this this is a situation that's not going to turn out well but there's a lot of real good educational stuff in here you remember what i say about the forest and the trees common things are common you know don't miss out of the forest for the trees and they had the medicine to say you see if you hear hear hoofbeats it's probably not zebras it's probably horses you know okay i am confused my brother is 50 years old and he has stage four malignant melanoma in his spine and brain and everywhere in between and you talked about his case three months ago i remember that case because this guy was put on those two brand new immunotherapy drugs he was asking about what are these two drugs mac and mac almost it sounds like i said he's lucky he's that these drugs are out there because he's got to have that BRAF mutation, he should respond dramatically, I said. All right, you talked about his case three months ago. I said he should respond dramatically. What does the question say? He responded dramatically. I said that three months ago. To the two immunotherapy drugs you mentioned, and he got brain radiation. I told him he would do that. He was doing great until seven days ago, and he got weak in his legs. Follow-up MRI of the spine showed 100% shrinkage of the tumors that were pressing on his spine. Got that? So he has a 100% response to the immunotherapy in the lesions that are pressing on his spine. But the brain has more and bigger lesions. Why? You know? You, may, you should know now. You've been here years. You've been here years. We've talked about the blood-brain barrier before, remember? Oh, my goodness. Why and what can be done? Well, the why is the blood-brain barrier. Okay, put the next one up there. So we are talking about melanoma and brain metastases. That's what the topic is. Put that up there. Last Friday, don't put the next one up yet. Last Friday after this program, when I got to the office, don't be late, you said, we got a call from the emergency room at the local hospital that a 60-year-old man had been in the emergency room that night. He was still in the emergency room, and he had had a seizure. He had no prior history of seizures. In my day and today, the most common cause of a seizure in a non-epileptic, non-head injury male over the age of 50 is cancer of the lung with an unrecognized metastasis to the brain. And this patient had been shown to have a mass in his lung and they did a non-contrast enhanced CT, not a real diagnostic CT. They did the same CT they did if you fell off your bike and you had a head injury. It's not terribly good, but it could pick up gross stuff, and he had a spot on his brain. And so he came to the office. I said, when you get, when you get him out of there, send him all. He didn't get there till 4 o'clock. I was still there at 7 o'clock last night, I mean, last Friday night, seeing the guy. Put this next one up. This is the incidence of brain metastases in different malignancies. It's a pie chart. The biggest one there, excuse me, the biggest one there is lung cancer. Mm -hmm. The next biggest one, you probably can't read. Breast cancer. Breast cancer, he could see pretty good without his glasses on. And then melanoma. And then all the rest of the cancers put together. Well, the number one cancer in the country is lung, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The number two cancer in the country is breast. Uh -huh. That makes good sense. You can pull that down. It melanoma is down around number 11 or something, isn't it? I, I could squint down to 2020. Well, good. You just did. <laughs> so the point is that almost as much brain metastasis occurs with melanoma which is a much lower incidence cancer than breast and lung, which are high incidence, 
and this patient had it. Okay. So let's go next just to how, but how this whole thing works. So under in, when you have a new malignant melanoma, it's that big old long algorithm, and you work yourself through this algorithm, then immediately when you have a melanoma greater than three millimeters, it may be in a lymph node, when you start looking, at, looking for tests and need doing these scans of the lung, let me just remember, I always say, remember this, I say, in the Bible it says, you spread your seed on barren soil, it doesn't grow. Fertile soil, it grows. Side of the road, it grows, choked out by the weeds, barren soil, it doesn't grow. The fertile soil for the growth of melanoma is brain, liver, lung. So when you're doing the scan to look at the liver, lung, lymph nodes, and brain, here it goes. So now you've got new, new melanoma, and it's in the brain, you start working your way down through this big old long thing. This patient right here did have this inhibitor here we we're talking about. And then he did get these two new, new immunotherapy drugs and he got the radiation to his head and he, he did well. Okay, you, with, you got that one out of the way? Now, he, he did what he should have done and he responded. Now we're going to go over to the patient who has the melanoma. They do the scan. They do the brain scan. It is normal and there's no metastasis. You'll remember in small cell lung cancer, even if there's no metastasis, we radiate the brain to prevent recurrence because if we don't, it'll occur 50% of the time. We do know that, do that melanoma. So now you got the, not this patient, but the patient's cousin, so to speak, who did not have a brain metastasis at the time of his treatment, but had that positive gene and had all the rest of this disease and it got better, who subsequently has a brain metastasis. When you pull this boy up here, there are two types of metastasis. The one this patient had is called synchronous, meaning it's there at the time of diagnosis. And the type that shows up later is metachronous, meaning it occurs at a separate place in time. Then you start giving it points, and then you get down here to how long are they gonna let live. And if it comes up later, then you get uh, Le less points, it becomes up to start, but none of these survivals are very good. That survival's five months, and that one's 18 months, and none of those are extremely lengthy. Okay, show up this next MRI. This MRI is an MRI with one metastasis in the brain. This is the same MRI as that patient that I saw last Friday with the lung cancer who had a single metastasis within the brain. We had not biopsied the lung yet. If it was any kind of cancer except small cell, then this tumor would have either been surgically removed or gamma knife treated because it's a single metastasis. You got it? Mm -hmm. Show the next one. This is the type of brain scan that you see in that patient from a few weeks prior who was the truck driver who got confused yes. and couldn't find his house right. and they said they, the tumor crossed the midline and could not be surgically removed, uh -huh. blah, blah, blah. This one here still could receive the gamma knife but it's crystal clear so much of that brain's involved and remember that was an astrocytoma that this isn't going to turn out well. What your patient has now, and what this pa what this patient's got now, look at this next one. Mm -mm -mm. You see the surface of the brain? Yes. See these little black spots? Yes. Those are scattered melanomas. They just look like little cherries or, or raisins or something on the top of the brain, right? Right? All right, put up the next one because this is the, this is the, algorithm and the outlook in patients with metastasis in the brain. And this bottom one here is the survival 
of multiple metastases in the brain. This is time. That's two years out here. I showed you there that it was five months. Well, that line is coming down and hitting early on there. That's probably hitting at about six months, right? If it has a different mutation, now this is not the mutation that this patient had because those drugs he took do not cross the brain, blood brain barrier. But if there's one other mutation that he has where another drug that could be added here, and I do not know if he has it, we'll have to go look, then you could add this other drug and bang, look how that survival curve jumps up. Well, that survival curve doesn't jump up great since that's 25% survivals, which was what that last one said, but still at two to three or four years, this patient may still be alive if you go back and check that tumor and it has a different, has a, another marker that was not the marker that drove his treatment here. Is that, are you still with me? Mm -hmm. yes, what do so we yes. have here? Uh, that's his another algorithm. algorithm. Yeah, right. well, say, I thought one? we just had one. Well, we just did have one. Okay. We had an algorithm that started way up there at diagnosis. This algorithm is all the way down here where we know what we're dealing with. And when you get way down here to the bottom, it says stereotactic brain radiotherapy. So what we really don't know is, because he does say that he, that he has... Um, has more... So he has multiple lesions within his brain, and they're bigger. Well, that algorithm brings you into this. This sort of looks like a head. You got the next one up there? Looks like a headdress of an uh, Aztec warrior or something. But this actually is the headdress of how you do stereotactic brain radiotherapy so that you can focus only on the metastasis and... What you have to do then is you come at it from every different direction, but it all focuses right there on that one spot so that the normal brain doesn't have to get a whole bunch of radiation. It gets 20, 25 different pieces of the brain get a small amount of radiation where the focus all goes in the middle so that the focus gets 25 doses of radiation and each part of the brain only gets one dose of radiation. Pull that down. I promise you this patient will be treated with additional radiation of that type or whole brain radiation. Don't know because we don't know this, the, the, the total picture here. They are doing another, they're taking that tumor back out and looking for this sort of rare genetic marker which is not present in more than 10 or 15% of cases. If it's there, that's a fairly decent outlook. If it's not there, then the long-term survival here is going to be poor. But the reason that everything else responded is that the natural protection of the brain, and I call it God-given blood-brain barrier, keeps poisons and things from getting to the brain when they're in the body. So when you've got gastroenteritis or something like that, you're sick as a dog with these poisons and stuff, your brain's doing just fine. Now, the blood-brain barrier does not stop pain medicines like morphine from getting in there, and we're just getting ready to get to that in a second when we get to the news. So that's the reason that it was able to grow. Those drugs could not get into the brain. The radiation therapy that was given controlled the blood-brain barrier, controlled those tumors for, what, three or four months, but didn't kill them off enough to not keep them from growing. So that's it. Got it? Got it. All right. Now we got just a few more minutes. Is anybody news, in the news of, news green of room? the day? Yes, green room is ready. Rick is off ice skating. Oh, it starts it starts today, doesn't it? it well, it's uh, this week, so we'll talk starts about today. that. Yeah. Starts today. Okay. Now, Rick is strapped on his skates. Okay. Well, I want to quickly say something about can't do without without the COVID. If you look at this again, the official Georgia state. Zero death, zero cases. Well, we all know, I said last week, that there's not zero cases because, I mean, I've treated them and Ray's treated them, and you can now go over to Southern Drugs or one of these drugstores, and they can give you the Paxlovid without a doctor even ordering it. So if you go to it, and, this, and I, that's why Ray has said continually, they, they've been driving these statistics, and they can tell you anything they want. Well, I got sent some statistics the other day because 
you don't want to know it, but I'm now on the Fannin County Health Board, so I've, I'm getting health board statistics that are coming from another place. Well, they, they felt you had nothing to do. They they seen a little gap in time there that that's you a, needed to occupy. That, that's a really good question. I, <laughs> I did say, do I have time to do this, and do I have the skill set you need? They decided I had the skill set, and they're going to help make the time so a lot of it can be done. Oh, that's by, what they always by say. Zoom, yeah. That's anyway, what they always say. Doc. If you take the number of people in Fannin County who have been prescribed Paxlovid in the in this last week is 26. <laughs> so, so the number's probably greater than 26 because some of them might have got their prescriptions filled in one of the adjacent counties. Okay, here is the the, the news of the day. I was going to make your one read the one that says exercise can help fight colon cancer even if patient is obese yeah well if you've got colon cancer and you're overweight you know you don't think about exercise but actually put him on an exercise program and i've said this with every kind of cancer can improve the survival and do you remember why that is because you breathe better and if you get pneumonia or a complication you survive the complication better not that the cancer itself responds better to the surgery or the treatment but the most important one is the top one. I want you to read about the top one. What a vaccine against deadly fentanyl might be near. I see a, I see a, I see a look of confusion on your face. A vaccine against deadly fentanyl might be near. Now, that's a real strange thing, isn't it? You usually think a vaccine against an infection like HPV or measles, or flu, or the perish thought, Ray, the COVID vaccine. Now, there is a vaccine in, in, in um, development phase that has passed the animal experimentation. And this vaccine creates at the blood-brain barrier a antibody that prevents fentanyl when it attaches itself to the vascular tour of the brain and has to diffuse into the brain, which is what would kill you and you stop breathing. It prevents it from going into the brain. It does not prevent morphine or hydrocodone or other pain medicines from going into the brain. So the place that you would use this vaccine, if it, it's going into clinical trials this week in Europe, it, the place you would use this vaccine are in the incurable, sort of incorrigible narcotic addict who uses a drug for his high that does not include fentanyl. So let's say it's a teenager smoking pot or it is cocaine, or it's oxycodone, or Valium, or Xanax, but they are hopelessly addicted, and they are getting their product from the street, and there are, what, 125 drug overdoses a day in the United States from fentanyl-contaminated yes. street drugs. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that if you give this vaccine to those people that are using another drug and it came from China or, where, or South America and across the border and has been laced with fentanyl, then when you take it, you won't die because the fentanyl won't get in your brain. Now, I'm not, I don't have a horse in this race at all, but this becomes the governments of the world the, this is being developed in Europe, by the way. The National Institutes of Health of the world taking their money and developing a fail-safe for the incurable drug addict to prevent them from having an early death from fentanyl. And you're going to have people... Have you, have you read... Um, 
the uh, Emperor of All Maladies, the book about cancer, uh, cancer cure goes back 2,000 years. The, the squeaky wheel during all the antibiotic era of the 30s and 40s when they were bitten penicillin was, nobody's spending any money on cancer. So when they start spending a bunch of money on developing a vaccine for narcotic addicts not to die from an overdose when they're cocaine addicts, then the thousands of people you'd have to give it to may be only a small group that are going to get saved unless you're assuming that every drug out there is going to be contaminated with fentanyl. So that'll be a lot of money going to a small group of people who are out there breaking the law so that people who have a, a hemophilia or pediatric uh, uh, lung disease concerns may say, why aren't we spending that money on pediatric cancer or on breast cancer or something else? But anyhow, the concept is very interesting. I thought since we had discussed the blood-brain barrier today with this melanoma metastasis that it was really interesting that the blood-brain barrier got to the news this week in an entirely different way. See, I really thought you were going to bring up lab-grown meat ah. gets green light from the FDA. See, when you bring your head, I thought no, that's what you... I am. That, that that one is... Tell me about that one. No, 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 no. You have to... You have a plane to catch. I do. But we're, but if you there is a restaurant here in Blue Ridge that serves a plant-based hamburger that is really good. And I am not against plant-based food. Okay? It's like... I mean, I like, you have soy... Uh, soy, what do you call it? Uh, bacon and and uh, all these things it taste terrible but if people want to eat them i don't mind it but laboratory grown meat is a that is that's gmo to the nth degree that's genetically modified food that's that's grown in a that's like you make, make uh, you said plant-based that's not plant-based that's right that's what i say so that's what i'm saying so plant-based okay I have my personal choice, but if somebody tells me, hey, there's a plant-based this, that, and they like it, okay, they like I'm it. Gonna ask you they to, like I'm going to ask but... you to do yourself a favor. Oh, gosh. I'm not going to advertise it, but it's across the street from the back of my house. All right, I and know. And people call it, the, um, call it the Vinyl Pub because it has the records and they play all the all music right. in it. And they sell a a plant-based hamburger in there that my hamburger eating buddies and i happen to have tried it say that it is really good now houston's in atlanta also has a plant-based hamburger that is really good now i can't tell you about anybody else's but i'm not a vegetarian and i ate big old hunks of roast beef last night that my wife had cooked and the night before that we had chili and one night a week she has two nights a week she got fish we got salmon one night and we got that white fish that uh, costs so much another night but four, five nights a week she'll feed me country food well we are going into the holiday weekend and next then we'll have weekend. turkey right and turkey so, sandwiches so i'm not for sure it might be a couple weeks but i will get back to you and when i do i will be able to give you a report on the plant-based on, on burger, plant -based burger. That's okay. the we're not gonna be here next friday no we can. Ha I, are we going to show up? Are we going to show next Friday at this time? One of the the, the uh, archives. Yeah, maybe, shows? maybe, maybe we might put a, ask the doc up. We might do that. Okay. All right. We'll see. I'm All right. Sure. Well, listen. The weather is going to be beautiful in Blue Ridge today. The high is going to be 32 or something. So wear your jacket. Georgia Cancer Specialist Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. Thank you for this segment. You have a safe trip with your grandchildren and family and i hope they enjoy it and um i hope they can keep up with you <laughs> right yeah i hope yeah. they can keep up yeah, with you right? they are 18 20 and 22 and in great physical conditions so they're gonna I, wear me out yeah all right folks we'll be right back with the Go all star political panel and uh joeen and bruce are here rick's out ice skating we'll talk about that but um, I might just throw the old crypto right in the middle of the two of them and see what, see what they come up with. So we'll take a break.